Excellent, Randy. Excellent. Great to see you. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. This is episode 125 of Tech Sales Insights. Uh, really excited to have Mark Stevenson on uh, today. He's a uh, longtime friend, great uh, go to market expert, uh, CRO of uh, many places that have done really well. He's uh, currently go to market advisor, among some other things. Today, our title topic is go to market alignment for efficiency and leverage. Uh, also, thank you to Modigi, who's a uh, new sponsor of Sales Community. Uh, so appreciate Modigi being a sponsor for today. Um, they've got an awesome uh, 10 minute analysis where they use their secret sauce to help you automatically identify, cleanse, and fix inaccurate contact information inside Salesforce. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, Mark. Because certainly, contact data is uh, of utmost importance because if you, you know good contact data, I guess you can't really sell. Uh, so anyway, and also for those that are members of Sales Community, thank you so much. Uh, for those that are not, you can uh, uh, click on the link that Tucker has there, uh, SalesCommunity.com/slash/spring-free. So lot, lots of great content there to help you learn more and sell more. So I've known Mark, I think we've been trying to figure out about 23 years. So back when I, although your forehead gets, is getting bigger and bigger, I, I guess I shouldn't talk, but <laughs> I, yeah. I think I had some hair uh, back, back then. We're all watching more forehead. There you go. Mark lives in uh, San Francisco. Um, and besides work and family, he is an amazingly uh, passionate aficionado of vintage motorcycles and cars. Uh, the, the trip you just had to, to the UK to pick up your uh, custom wheels there, that was that had to be a great experience. It was awesome. Uh, so cool. So um, as uh, those that know you know, you went to uh, UCLA, you are a proud Bruin. Uh, so maybe uh, tell us uh, what was your uh, job out of uh, UCLA and then uh, maybe quickly go through your uh, career track. Yeah, out of, out of UCLA, I sold typewriters in Century City uh, for Xerox. Uh, I found out that doing more calls every day gave me a better probability of selling. So I did it. There and, you go. Uh, many years uh, at, at Xerox, sales leadership, and then a general management role in Chicago. But, uh, you know, ha my career half the time in very large companies like Cisco and HP uh, global enterprise sales, uh, perfecting it, multi-product sales. Uh, but the last half, really in early stage firms. And uh, I've, got, I've got an approach about how to really build consistent uh, execution. And uh, that's part of the blog series we're working on. Excellent. So the, uh, the, the first blog was uh, why ICP is so critical. And uh, Tuck, we have uh, Tucker, I didn't compliment him. So Tucker behind the scenes is always is helping. So Tucker, I don't know if you're able to find those and pull, those, uh, pull them up at all. Uh, the second blog that had already been posted is uh, how to hire top talent. Certainly something that is very crucial. And the recent one that we're going to be talking about today is uh, go to market alignment. One team, one go to market for efficiency and leverage. Uh, excellent piece for sure. And then as a uh, upcoming uh, uh, surprise, I guess not a surprise, uh, your blog number four is a priority around aligning metrics and building the right RevOps stack for your business. So uh, be on the lookout for that one. So um, I guess jumping right in, uh, in this kind of tight, you know, I guess having a great go-to-market engine is always important, but probably especially in this tight economy, right? It is. It's funny how uh, with gray hair, uh, what's old is new again. And I've always thought the true north is what's your ideal customer profile? That helps everything. Right. And, and that is the centerpiece. And that's how you get efficiency and how you can really drive leverage. And it certainly is applicable in this economy we're in now. But I'd say it's always applicable to have that kind of focus. Awesome. And then uh, being, uh, as you mentioned on the ICP side, uh, being aligned to an uh, ICP is cornerstone to your approach. Uh, but I heard you say the other day that the notion of a the, the notion that a customer is dead. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? How can a customer be dead? <laughs> well, sometimes I'm prone to stretch a point to make one. Uh, and the idea is, if you the real the customer metaphor is really dead because it belies a technology sale where you would sell a perpetual 
you'd be all about getting the the deal and you'd pass paper through a partner, probably more of a fulfillment partner versus a value added reseller. And they were accountable for going to getting the customer to adopt a solution. And if you take that approach, and I think a lot of people still kind of take that approach, you are in big trouble in SaaS because the metaphor goes from customer. It's all about the user. If you can't get usage, you are not going to get the NDR you need for your business. You're not going to grow. And so that metaphor is, is the, is the change. You go from customer to a user concept. Gotcha. And then uh, in tracking users, there's obviously a whole bunch of kind of metrics and things there that you need to do. Um, do you think, uh, I would imagine kind of current newer age SaaS companies do a probably great job of tracking it and probably some of the legacy, I'll call it on-prem players that are making that migration probably really struggle with that. Yeah, I, I, I can't really think everybody struggles with that micro focus that you really need to have around usage. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a great book uh, on this topic that I would encourage everybody to read. It's called How to Grow a Profitable SaaS Subscription Business. Uh, it's a technology SaaS playbook uh, by Lay and Wood. And they really talk about you, you need four customer strategies. And it sounds simple, but you really want to align everything around these. And the first is, what's your, what's your approach to adopting uh, the right ICP customer? And the right ICV customer has the biggest need, will expand with you, and you can build a great business around it. So really focus your entire go-to-market around the adoption of high, high users that are really great and profitable for your business. Um, that land first strategy, that's all the new logo. But then second, how do you adopt? How do you get the customer to adopt uh, that solution? has to be a very focused uh, cross-functional practice and then what are your emotions to to expand thereafter and if you do those three things you still need a retention strategy and an approach but you really want to optimize around those four focus areas land adopt expand renew and make sure your processes uh, your approach your incentives all hit those four focus areas yeah and then what about how does the concept of kind of product market fit uh, come into play here? Because obviously if something is, you know, for lack of better words, you know, kind of sells itself, that's one dynamic, but then certainly a lot of times people get, you know, brought in um, to help on the sales side because it's, you know, th things are struggling. And a lot of times, you know, CEOs don't want to be told that they're, you know, kids ugly for lack of better words. Yeah. Uh, I stole a concept from Looker that got by Google that I think is really Again, what is old is new. Um, it's called value one. And the idea is, let's take the land. I want to I focus and I want to land the right uh, first customer. I think, you know, in the past 10 years where everything was up and to the right, even a, you know, even a turkey can fly in a tornado. Uh, but you got to get down to why people buy now, because there's a CFO on the other side of every order agreement. You got to think that way. And so value one is the concept of, hey, what's the metric that sucks for them today? What's the real need? What's the pain around it? What is it, What is the metric that exposes that current pain? And then what would the metric need to be if the investment uh, would be, uh, good, be a good return? And so it's current state, desired state. What's that singular value one metric that if they buy your solution, they're going to get that improvement? And that, that's a really great organizing principle for product market fit because it's, it's not, hey, we're going to improve rep productivity. That's too high level to figure out product market fit. It might be we need to improve an AE's ability to get uh, meetings that turn into pipeline. That could be value one. Um, and it's interesting. I was talking to David Schneider, actually, who is a, a long time. CRO of ServiceNow, and he's at Kotu. He said, "With PLG, actually, you know, every you know, easy come, easy go. If uh, if yeah. there's no friction on the way in, you don't really know why they bought, and there's no friction on the way out. So a lot of PLG companies are really struggling with retention rates, and they don't have a signal for what the value was of the solution. 
So value one's, I think, a really defining concept around that. And you can organize uh, all the way through. Like for the land, what's the value one for uh, customers? their usage and if they use more that's only that's only uh good and when you hand off to customer success they better be adopt getting the customer adopting to that value one and the cs team ought to be validating the value one and not until you've delivered value one so says the customer have you earned the right to talk about value two which would be where you can expand and if you really lock that in retention's going to happen yeah, you think about. It. Go ahead. Go ahead. In the in the uh, enterprise space, what do you, what do you think is the uh, kind of ROI these days that people are looking for? Are they talking about value. Yeah, it's obvious. It, it's inside twelve months. <laughs> Nobody's right. going to go for anything longer than that. If not, if not a quarter, and uh, right. everybody's trying to consolidate vendors, so you better have a ten x improvement around it. You know this value one concept. Where have we heard this before? It's the M and medic metric. What's the metric of right. improvement? Totally. We had a, a John McMahon on a, you know, a month or so ago, the uh, father or godfather of a med medic or med, med pick now. So it definitely was uh, fascinating. So uh, moving on here. So what about organizationally? Any tips aligning the go-to-market functions around the customer journey? You know, typically people are, you know, stove pipe by functional area, but I think you've got a concept aligning more around the customer. Yeah, I, I, it's an old idea again, but it's the first thing I would urge every CRO to do is, is this kind of this idea of staple yourself to a suspect uh, and then later staple yourself to a customer. But early days, you know, what's the path that an MQL would take from marketing to being validated as an SQO? How does that SQO which is pipeline by definition, go into how do you demonstrate capability for a demo or a POC? What's that process like? Um, really, really understand that, that whole process all the way to technical win. Don't, don't pay a rep on a win until value one is really defined so that you can really drive adoption. What's that kickoff like that you have for the customer? Onboarding, customer training, all the way through to customer NBRs and QBRs. To, and you want to make sure that path is efficient. The handoffs are really well known, you know, and use an old concept like RACI, you know, who's responsible for each step, who's accountable, who's consulted versus informed uh, around that process. And uh, you really got to, if you define that, process, you'll find bottlenecks, you'll find inefficiencies. And that's the best place to add technology, by the way, is once you really understand the process. Otherwise, you're just going to use technology to speed up a bad process and do the wrong things quicker. There you go. And um, I, I forgot that earlier. So anybody that's watching along, feel free to comment, ask any questions. You got Tucker behind the scenes that will uh, pull them forward. So uh, look forward to uh, any, any of your participation. So you, you talked about stapling yourself to a suspect and a, a prospect, but also there'd be value in doing it, I would imagine, for somebody that's uh, an expansion, kind of supersized opportunity, and also kind of a re retention-based opportunity, correct? Yeah, definitely. Uh, leading customer success that it has in the past. You know, CS teams, customer success team, you know, sometimes it, it, it's like renewal management. Um, I don't think that pencils in the new economy uh, customer success teams versus new logo teams and account managers. It can't be one's a second class citizen versus the other. It's just if you if you embrace this value one idea around use cases, the new logo team is finding value one, but the customer success team should be finding uh, validating value one, but finding value two and three and four and driving that as expansion. So we really, you know, we really looked at customer success teams, um, forecasting in Salesforce, um, really uh, driving pipeline for value two expansions. And you get this malarkey around, well, that'll break the trust if we're selling. No, if you're focused on usage, isn't it a good thing for a customer to be using your solution with more uh, different areas? So you got to debunk that kind of thing. And that's how you get 
net dollar retention greater than 120 percent is having a team focused on those expansions. But again, you have to map that customer journey uh, from the kickoff all the way through expansion, renewals, and and you got to have playbooks for your CS team. What if I have a low usage, high value customer versus low and low and, and map those strategies out so that just like in new logo sales, it's automatic on what to do. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then what's the fee in your kind of uh, desired state? What's the feedback mechanism on the product side? If things need to be tweaked and updated, how does that get back into engineering and product marketing? Yeah, <clears throat> there's you know, multiple approaches around that. One is I do, a, we do a cross, and my companies I work with is do a cross-functional MBR where product, sales, uh, customer success are all all working around the same metrics and looking at the same metrics. And that, that really makes sure that uh, you're looking at what are the requests for feature enhancements. There's always customers behind it. Uh, it's always in Salesforce, otherwise it doesn't matter. Uh, I need a customer, I need dollars behind the feedback that we're talking about from a product standpoint. Also, there's a great company I've used in the past called Closed, and they do analysis of your wins and losses, and you get unbelievably tight data uh, around uh, customer sentiment on product as well. A couple ideas there. Wow, very cool, for sure. Uh, and then, so talking about uh, talking about M MQLs, and there's always kind of debate with marketing, right? You know, MQ and marketing and sales, MQLs to SQLs, marketing textbook has their kind of bonus based on the MQL stuff. Some of the time, not all the time, sales says, well, hey, th those leads suck because they not, they're not really converting. So there should be some tie in there. So kind of given that marketing and sales sometimes can be at odds, kind of how do you uh, kind of improve the collaboration there uh, with sales and marketing? Yeah. This one I really thought about a lot is you need to be in cahoots with the CEO to set cross-functional corporate measures. Because otherwise, if you don't, everybody's just going to sub-optimize for their function. When you say you, you're saying you as a CRO. Yeah. As a CRO, you need to be locked in with the executive team that you need cross-functional metrics. In the absence of that, people want to succeed, so they're going to use their own metrics for their own group. So an example, I'll give you an example of bad versus good metrics. Marketing, uh, you know, if, if otherwise they're going to optimize in MQLs, who cares about the lead unless the lead actually converts? And so what I would say is the marketing goal is an SQO. Well, wait a minute. That's dependent on the AE following up on the, on, on the lead. Yep, that's right. And now you have a closed loop. On right. These are actually driving success, right? So that, that, that's a good example. And, the BDR, this one's very contested, by the way, is the BDR hold them accountable for meetings. No, that's a that's an activity measure for sure. But hold them accountable for meetings that turn into SQOs pipeline. There's that interdependency between the BDR and the AE as an example. Yeah. You know, another one would be the AE. Well, sell any deal. All revenue is good. No, 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 no. Only the deal that's going to actually, the customer is going to adopt and expand. The best gift you can give your customer success teams is new logos that actually really need what you have. <laughs> yeah. right? So it's, it's selling to your ICP and having a clear understanding of the value one is the metric, not just a new deal. Right. And then customer success, you know, the idea of users, Man, I can, I've, I've seen so many times when users are really high, but they still don't renew because you never really got the value one with that customer. So that's the metric for CS. It ain't users. It ain't how many people showed up daily, weekly, monthly on your platform. It's are they getting the value out of it? Yeah. Do you have uh, kind of preferences in terms of where marketing reports in? Because you kind of you have the, you know, what was a legacy VP of sales? Now that role has kind of morphed into... CRO, which covers a lot of the other go-to-market pieces, which may, you know, may or may not involve marketing. What are your thoughts? Very controversial, I think. In the, in the world of great inflation over the last 10 years, everybody's a CRO, but 
they're really ahead of sales. They right. don't have marketing. They don't have customer success. Actually, when I was at Episode, I came up with, well, I want to be a chief customer officer because I want to air gap how a prospect becomes a customer, how a customer, all that. And I wanted to make sure there was, you know, complete alignment. It's probably not the right title because that's now post sales. Chief customer officer may be more indicative because, you know, if you ask most CROs, they don't have marketing. Uh, they don't have customer success. Some more have customer success than marketing. But I'll also be really candid is I thought as a longtime CRO, ah, I'm going to take over marketing. I'm going to take over customer success. Well, I'm a better uh, buyer of marketing and customer success services have, having done it myself. Um, and I do think it's for a systematic sales leader, they can become a really good CRO and a business partner to the CEO by having the full uh, go-to-market function of marketing, sales, customer success, rev ops, uh, all together. So that, you know, you, know, you can tune it uh, to the biz. Yeah. And um, I know a key, another key part is the uh, OKRs, obje objectives and key results. But, you know, how great would it be if you had kind of the, the CRO and CMO actually t tied in on the same uh, results in terms of their compensation, right? It just seems so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It's, and I thought a lot about this, too. And I'm going to argue that, and it's in my blog, and we'll cover it more in the future, but there's really four lagging metrics. I learned this. At Xerox, the first year out of college was there's activity metrics and result measures and leading and lagging. And the lagging metrics, everybody's good at tracking them. But there's really four lagging metrics that you should care about as a company. And they're in this order. It's ARR, you know, 33333, three, 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 uh, tripling. NDR, and if you're going to optimize in this year of efficiency for one metric, it's NDR. And then third, the third measure, every single VC is going to ask the same three questions. Guarantee it. It's, hey, tell me about your quota distribute, your quota attainment. And, it, you know, how much quota deployed and are you over your attainment number? And then the fourth question is going to be how many reps? How many of them are there? And that's that's really going to be the tail of the tape on it. But I think the juice is in the activity measures. The, the, lag, uh, the leading measures is you know, quality meetings to ICP, number one. Uh, number two, SQOs, pipeline, early and late stage to your ICP. And third, you know, customer use case adoption, value one. And then fourth, it's about talent, right? Is, and you got to really be measuring this. How many hires were exactly to your spec? And you should metric for that spec because if you know, garbage in, garbage out on that one. And then you ought to have an, a 90 day certification program on your onboarding. Did they certify it and be tracking that as well? Talent, talent is the uh, is the key to good to great companies for sure. So if you're not tracking that at a, at a corporate level, big problem. Yeah, I'm uh, very passionate, as I know you are, about the you know, for, first 90 days. And we've both been to companies where all of a sudden you get there and people have been there one year or multiple years and they're basically just bad and then you go back and say okay if they would have done a proper you know 30 60 90 day plan uh you know they would have been probably weeded out or they would have been better coached and developed to then be better players so i'd always feel bad coming to these companies where they just had lousy coaching and you say well it's you know partially the individual's fault but it's even more more the company's fault for not providing them the great the the proper feedback, the proper guidelines, the proper coaching. And then you're kind of in this fire drill. I'm like, okay, well, you suck because this is this and that. Here's the things you need to improve. Hope you, you know, we're going to help you. But if those things don't happen, anything can happen up and up to and including termination. So what I always found, the good news is typically the people that were, that you kind of wanted to get rid of, they would kind of self-select. So you didn't have to go through the HR process. And then those who really had it in them, in their head, in their heart, to do more, to improve, those would be the ones that would stay, that would fight it out, and then eventually become top performers. Oh, man, that is 
Absolutely uh, true. I, you know, commentary and a cheat I have on that is look at all the layoffs recently and how much of that was performance management that should have happened prior. We'll exactly. just take the easy button and sweep everybody under the, <laughs> under the, Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I overhired. That's so lazy. You need to be looking, doing the old GE nine block, put your people in every quarter, every month, do it on a whiteboard. See if your if your leader can actually align where you know your stars are, your middle performers, and the, the folks need attention. But I, I, I'll give you a cheat that I really didn't. People weren't receptive to it in in the the, the, the high growth heady days. But it's a cheat on talent uh, that is so good. I'm using it every single day today. Is in your interview process for an AE or a sales leader or any role really. You always have a challenge and i think the challenge ought to be give them enough data that they need to do a 30 60 90 day uh plan and have that be the challenge and present to your hiring managers what what they would do if they came in the first 90 days and the benefit of doing that is you really find out well people do the hard work half the people don't show up with it they'll they'll cancel out yep and you really get to see if people are are planning for success. And if they have the experience they're talking about, it's an easy, easy thing to do. And they want to do it and see how you receive it. But also it's how you would manage them in the first 90 days. They're writing their own 90 day plan. Why don't people do that? Don't know. In the, in the days be, prior where it was fast hiring and, hey, I want to do this. I don't have experience. That would slow hiring down. But. It's a good idea to slow hiring down. Make sure you get it right. Totally. So um, I'll do a plug. You uh, were uh, kindly contribute contributor to here as well, but Tucker, maybe you can put the link up. But um, for those who want to know more about performance management, performance reviews, nine block, uh, some some other things, uh, some great great content in there by uh, Mark and probably ninety other uh, great CROs as well. So for those that may not understand the uh, uh, nine box or nine block or nine box. So basically, it's a grid. If you if you picture a, a tic tac toe um, kind of fi figure, uh, you can have different metrics. But typically, the ones I see are kind of based on performance and based on potential. And that kind of is a good self weeding process to figure out where people are at. And uh, for those of you that are, um, you know, I'll say maybe lower levels or you really you know any level where it's individual contributor, district manager uh R rvp maybe uh other you know, regional vp or uh, whatnot you know any good company will do this process and i always found it helpful asking so i would say hey you know where you know wh where am i you know on your on your grid and be like well, what do you mean well you know you know what i mean because you're doing this and then similarly you know where, where am i stack ranked so i'd always encourage anybody watching whether you're a bdr or you're yeah you know, uh, I guess maybe not the CEO, but you know, so if you're a direct report to the CEO, you know, any anybody within there, um, any. Other hmm. oh. oh, sorry, <laughs> I, th I think I cut in and out. There. I don't know what happened. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, any other advice um, on? uh that around kind of uh individuals getting feedback on the nine nine box or uh stack ranking well i just uh you know i i pair it what you always say which is asking your boss what can i do different or better right and if you do that all the time you're going to know where you are in the stack ranking and, you're, and your feedback is a is a gift and so you can ask your your boss or folks around you for that gift on a regular basis. What can I be doing different or better? I want to get an A. Totally. And then, uh, so you talked about layoffs before. So uh, any advice for people uh, that have been impacted by recent tech layoffs? Yeah, I, I think he really, when you, you're looking at the companies, there's uh, actually, I, I'll tell you something I, Basically, I, I had an original idea in 1986. I can't remember it. I just steal everybody else's ideas and put them at play. So this is one from Peter Bell. He, uh, he's, he's got this idea around four M's to pick a company. I think it's really good. One is the market. Is it big enough? Is it growing 30% CAGR, et cetera? What's the business model? Think about 
where cash is key, profitability, uh, long-term cash. Look at Warren Buffett, what he invests in. Business model, number two. Number three is nobody's got time for working with jerks and people that don't have an experience. What's the management team like? Do they have experience in mm -hmm. doing this? Would you learn things from them? Uh, regardless of income, if you're early in your career, build the base of experience. And then the fourth M is really interesting. Magic. magic. What's the magic in the business? There ain't no magic in it. They don't have a clear vision where they're going to go. Life's too short. Find one that is have some magic. Yeah, totally. So um, I actually am totally subscribed to that theory, especially as I look at you know, companies potentially to invest in. And I also add on uh, product market fit. You know, does the company have product market fit or not? Because if they do, that makes life certainly a lot easier, as we know. Um, you know, what is what is the market? How big is the TAM? Uh, how can they do against it? Uh, what's a competitive landscape like? Uh, that's self-explanatory. And then uh, from a valuation perspective, um, kind of how how's the valuation? Because if you're coming in, a, a good chunk of your stock or good chunk your income could be based off stock. So kind of what does that look like? And right now you have a lot of companies who raise a lot of money at big valuations and, you know, see what are your options that you're getting? You know, what are they priced at? Because, you know, from day one, you could be potentially out of the money forever, right? So it could be a heroic act just to get back to the valuation that it was a year ago. But if they've kind of typically they'll reset or kind of do, do something. So those are some they uh, don't don't fall in the line of M's, but uh, some some other uh, attributes I, I throw on there as well. You know, it kind of brings to mind another a big thing, too, which is just six months ago, everybody was trying to drive unicorn valuations. Uh, Ten million in ARR gives you over a billion uh, in, in market cap. And, you know, I'll, I'll be candid when we did our Series C at at, at Evisor, we were a little disappointed because we were sub a billion in, in valuation. I'm like, oh my God, thank you <laughs> that we didn't get a, over a billion valuation. And Jerry Ting, CEO, would be saying the same thing too. Because how do you get to that? Um, you need, you're going to have a massive down round in the future. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you're better to be lucky than good. You're lucky to not get that kind of valuation. And the companies that have it, today boy you really got to look at their stock is not going to be worth what you you might get so really take a look at that these companies as well um it's a big it's a big problem that's going to shake out totally and you're uh, uh, talking before about people that have been you know laid off you know they will you know think they're laid off just because of the economy but in fact it is performance management so i always oh. tell people you know look in the mirror go talk you know have that open discussion with whoever it is that you work for you worked with to say what well, could i do different or better because more times than not they're getting rid of people they're not getting rid of the top performers they're getting rid of the bottom performers so take that as a lesson learned which can be really valuable you got to bite bite your bite your ego but you know so something that could be really uh really powerful in terms of what, what you uh, get out of it. So uh, Tucker, maybe Paul looks like we had a question from Tim. So Tim, thank you. And uh, for any others uh, watching or listening, feel free to chime in. Uh, says uh, Tim says, great talk, Randy. Thanks. Uh, one question from Mark is who should own the ICP, Ideal Customer Profile Identification, marketing sales product. I often see it being rushed, loose, and not nearly as scientific as it should be. Well, by the way, Tim, if you go, everybody on LinkedIn, look him up. He has this RevOps consulting business. Uh, he's got it going on in terms of how to really instrument for SaaS. And, you know, I think everybody's so overspent on RevOps tools and questionable impact. Uh, he can he can really help folks get to that. Um, actually, I'm working as an advisor for a company called Close Factor right now that really helps companies execute ICP. And it's interesting because I talk to folks like ICP, everybody knows ICP, everybody's working on, oh yeah? How, the way you can check is what is the BDR, what accounts are in the BDR and outreach sequence? What persona are they calling on? People, by the way, personas don't buy, people do. What people are they reaching out to on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And what are your territories full of with your reps? It's the big don't ask, don't tell going on right now is 
sales leadership, company leadership will wave hands about ICP. And then the reps are all figuring it out every Monday on who to go call on and get a meeting. Um, I think to answer his question, it's so critical. It always has been, but now it'll be more in focus. Is the CEO needs to own ICP uh, and really have a cross-functional ongoing focus on ICP. Yeah, definitely. And I think just as important as ICP is the, I'll call it the no fly zone. So uh, I had been at a couple of companies or, or one when we we're at HP together, we had a uh, kind of, we did a green, yellow, red, but then we found out people were the yellow, you really shouldn't. So we just said, you know, green and red. And as important it is to identify your ideal customer profile, it's even more important to be very prescriptive to say companies that are either this size or this industry or this geography or kind of wherever it is, you know, we cannot sell to them because, you know, reps will, you know, get on the phone with somebody, oh my God, it could be huge potential, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's managed by IBM or there's an incumbent or whatever, it's, you know, makes it harder. So just as important, I think, as identifying the ICP is the no fly zone, don't waste your time area. Yeah, that's a big question is if you're really disciplined about ICP, do you say no to leads that aren't in your ICP? What do you, what do you do? Uh, do you, are you measuring pipeline with and without ICP? Well, why should there be any ICP? And it gets back to, you really have limited resources. You have an opportunity cost for spending time on something that's outside of your ICP and early stage firms. Anyway, I'd even argue public companies that inefficiency will cost you. Yeah. Amazing. And then, uh, so Tim, thanks for that. Again, any others uh, want to chime in, please feel free. Uh, what about advice for those that are breaking into uh, tech sales? Uh, I would look at how I would look at a 30 year career and say, what market do I really want to be in? Where do I find the most interest in that and optimize for experience? Actually, I had a great, great um, Bill McDermott. Uh, he was at Xerox when I was there. Now he's. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, he was at SAP, and he rehired me at at Xerox. And he, he New York accent, fantastic. Mark, there's four things you want to focus on for the new company. One is it is it a really great market that's going to grow? And he was at Siebel. Uh, number two doesn't always work. Find the number one in that market. Number two is um, can you really impact that company? And do we really learn? Uh, uh, number three is, uh, is, do you think, you know, you'll have growth for that, that company? Can you see down the road that you'd want to be there? And fifth or fourth, the last one is really, he would say, then is it the right kind of income to support your family? Not first looking for the income. That's last, especially in your early career. Yeah. And then the, I'll, I'll give you an opposite a answer to that, which would be, you know, when we, when we were growing up, you had to stay somewhere, you know, five or 10 years. If you left within five years, something was wrong with you. Now uh, people can change jobs every year. So I always say the other side of it is don't overthink it. Just go somewhere. If you think you like it, you don't know enough to know what you know or don't know. So don't overthink it. Just go in, start going, and then you're going to learn and figure it out. And if you like it, great. And if not, you're going to you know, learn. And then you figure out, to your point, those things that you just mentioned. OK, then you then you could be on the lookout once you're somewhat known, known and proven. So other other perspective. Um, yeah. so we have a question from you. Another thing I, I'm, not, I'm really yeah. passionate about is in I'm, I'm very focused on talent and hiring talent. I'm often surprised how few AEs regional sales managers, VPs of sales, have two quota years back to back. They're, out, they're leaving like at 18 months, 12 months for something else. There's so much to be learned in trying to figure out how do I, how do I nail two consecutive years of quota retirement back to back? And a lot of the great learnings you'll miss if you're not there for that second, third, right. fourth year. And it's too right. easy to switch. Uh, oftentimes the jobs. Absolutely. 
So uh, Tim says, uh, great answer and thanks for the kind words. Close Factor and Modigi, both awesome up and comers at CRO should have on their radars. All right, thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Tim. So from Joe O'Malley, uh, we have what, what's the best way to manage the ICP issue as a BDR at a company with that type of environment where ownership can sometimes be sporadic? And I guess you could probably uh, add in that, you know, probably the identification of the ICP is probably sporadic and changes and they may not be that prescriptive. All right. This is going to sound like a total plant for the company I'm advising, advising but if you look at the RevOps stack, and, and we actually, on your site, uh, we've published how you look at a RevOps stack. There is nobody, you have LinkedIn, that's a standard. You have Zoom Info, those are standards. Outreach, maybe Sales Loft, those are standards for a BDR today. There is nothing that helps a BDR and AE prioritize the ICP. What are the accounts I should be calling on now? You need the right account the right person to talk to, the right message at the right time. And the best folks are doing it on spreadsheets. Close factor, actually a bunch of LinkedIn folks. Turns out that's, that's really expert data. And job boards are scraping all that, and they're scraping all the 10 Qs so that you can look at all your technographic data. You can look at all your accounts. Maybe I want to call on GCP users today or Amazon users tomorrow. Maybe I got to call on, on these different personas. It's the only thing I've seen. It's why I'm all in uh, to really scale ICP execution to the BDR and AE, which is the only place that you can foot it to, to really know if your ICP is actually working or not. Yeah. And, and great answer, Mark. And then Joe, great question. Uh, another way to look at it would be say, okay, you know, who's, who's selling a lot and what are they selling to? So a couple yeah. of examples would be, okay, if, you know, big Wall Street financials, you know, they just did a deal Goldman Sachs. Okay, go knock on the doors of, you know, of others so that, you know, it may or may not be your, your territory. So obviously you got to figure out how you can get the territory. Uh, another one would be maybe it's, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, restaurant chains. Maybe there's some software things that you have for restaurant chains. So if you see that it works there, because you certainly have so many different industries, so many geographies, so many different sizes, and then don't under underestimate the value of reference selling as well. So for mm. places where you've sold things before, or maybe your peers that are in the pit with you, uh, ho hopefully there's some face to face that's going on. Say, hey, you know, I ask, you know, hey, everybody, let, let's have everybody ask, you know, for any referrals that they have, any friends at similar companies. And obviously people want to be selfish to get referrals into companies that they can cover, but also nothing wrong with getting referrals to um, other companies. Uh, when I was at uh, e EMC and uh, opened up the uh, UK office uh, in New York City, um, uh, Andy O'Brien and uh, T Tom Heiser became my best friends because they were selling into uh, banks there in New York. And I'd say, hey, I ask who their people are in London, which sounds like a real basic thing. But, you know, what a fantastic entree could say, hey, we're, we're selling to you know, Joe and Susie and Sally you know, in, in New York. They said we should be talking to you. OK, great. You know, roll out the red carpet. Much easier sales cycle than than doing cold calling. You agree, I assume? I do. I, I'm going to hit you with a crazy concept. I was right. I'm actually leaving a CRO search uh, for a, um, a great PLG company. I'm doing an advisory for 80 million. And an ARR with less than 800K average order, $800 average order size. Imagine that velocity. And so we're looking for a PLG leader, and I've engaged two boutique retained search firms. And I wrote the spec for the founders to really get the right person. And they're, they work, they're four founders from MIT. They really work great together. And they're in the office every day because. You know, they're efficient, unlike that. And I told each one of the recruiters, hey, if you can meet these folks in person, it's going to be a real advantage. And neither one did. And I guarantee the one that would have gone on site to meet the CEO and the, and the, and the founders would have won the business. Oh, and, totally. And like you're not even thinking about that anymore is the press the flesh, the in-person meeting uh is is so valuable especially for strategic decisions right um anyway 
Absolutely. Um, so speaking about PLG, so in this year, uh, so according to Mark Zuckerberg, in this year of efficiency, uh, you've got plenty of ideas on how to drive teamwork and efficiency. What about getting leverage? Yeah. So that's something a CRO has got to be walk, looking at all the time is, is play chess, not checkers, a couple of quarters ahead. Because these are the things that take a lot of uh, long-term planning. So PLG, you know, um, it's sales serve versus self serve. And if you can build a self serve business model, that's fantastic. But maybe you didn't start off that way. Maybe it's a sell uh, a sales serve type of business. As a CRO, you need to be looking for that PLG opportunity. Maybe it's a defeatured product that you can sell, or maybe. You're in enterprise and mid-market, and you could defeature the product. Uh, you can simplify it to serve SMB. And for all revenue could be really good revenue from that standpoint. So I'm just, I think you need to think about it as a CRO. What are all my levers, right? So often sales leaders do whatever go to market they were good at, and you create sales debt along the way. You need to be thinking about efficiency that we talked about but leverage and two forms of leverage really is plg where is that and the irony right now is a lot of the plg companies are trying to also get good at outreach and do sales serve because oh my gosh the plg motion is slowing down what do i what do i do now um so that that plg motion i think you don't want to be pure you're probably uh, want to optimize for uh, your ICP, sales serve and and, and self serve, um, um, and with this company I'm working with right now, that's 80 million. 80 percent of that is self serve. Uh, what an amazing model! But don't just sub optimize for uh, the self serve. You need you need both those pieces. Yeah. It's uh, interesting to think about now with all this AI and chat GBT, everything else, if, uh, you know, especially at that, you know, lo lower level, you know, inside seller, if you, uh, do you think companies will actually get rid of inside sales reps? I don't think so, but I just think the nature of the work, uh, will change. Right. And, and, uh, if everybody's got the same chat GPT read on, on, uh, on a particular topic, what are you going to do to break through is still going to be the differentiator, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, channel certainly big, big topic as well. So uh, a bunch of things that come into play there. Um, what's your take on making sure the solution uh, can be predictably sold by your own sellers first? Yeah, I think that's, that's number one is, you know, I think CEOs will always be looking at with the CRO, hey, where, what about a channel motion? Uh, when's the right time to do it? And a CRO really needs to invest way ahead of when you're going to get predictable revenue. It always works in Excel, but it takes longer in the wild <laughs> to get a channel motion going. So that that is really, Randy, you're on it. That's the first thing to know is, well, am I predictably selling my solution today with my own sellers? Uh, because no channel is really going to meaningfully take on that solution unless they see the breadcrumbs of how uh, they would be able to sell it uh, uh, really predictably. So sometimes people might say, well, I'll just have the channel sell it. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to first solve that repeatability uh, to really get into a channel. And so once you, you're starting to see that repeatability, and play chess with all right how what would be good alliance partners where, where are customers buying this what what's their buying patterns so we can align the right uh sales strategy through channels and then i would say they have to get paid and have good margin right yeah that's the thing if if it's uh if it's a repeatable sales motion okay good i'm interested as a as a channel partner but what's the return on invested capital uh going to be is it predictable margins? Uh, is the street price pretty consistent? Am I going to get 20 plus uh, gross margin on resale, uh, as an example? That calculus has got to work. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get a head fake. The channel partner might say they'll sell it uh, on their dance card, but they won't dedicate resources to it. And then um, making sure the rules of engagement are straightforward, right? If I'm a, if I'm a channel partner and 
I'm worried about your sales team taking a deal direct that I bring. I mean, that's that's taboo. Yeah, it really is. It this this is you got to dance with the one that brung you. So if they gave you the lead, you can't uh, you can't cut them out. Even and the customer would be, hey, what if I bought it directly? No. No, no, no. And if you want to put a measure to it, you can't be 50-50 on channels. You, you, you got to take 80. If you're going to really let get the leverage, you got to lean into 85% plus of your, your motion being through channels, not 50-50. That'll, that'll never work. Yeah. Well, the other side of it is, I guess, you could identify different niches, right? So a lot of companies may do direct into the largest global accounts and they may have an SMB motion, uh, which is through the channel or they might say, hey, we're going to be U.S. centric here, but then we're going to be channel only in me and APJ. So there's also, I think, a lot, a lot of variations on the, on the theme, right? Well, you are a channel ex expert, a sophisticate of channels. And that that is exactly right. Uh, thank you. And then what about uh, incentives needing to be aligned? Oh, my gosh. You don't think you don't put this down. It ain't going to work. So. I'm also writing comp plans a lot for for my uh, the companies I'm working with. Uh, you know, quota, comp, all all work together. And you want to design these things in for scale as well. So one thing that we're doing is, I see early stage reps are like, well, it ought to be comp neutral to work with a channel. Okay, show me comp neutral in a comp plan, and I'll show you your quota is actually larger. Versus. You know, the incentive ought to be for an AE is if it goes through the channel, you're going to get more deals. You ought to be paid on what the net proceeds are to the company. And that is so if it's a 100K deal, 20K goes to the uh, the reseller partner, you get 80K of ARR and, and you're paid on that. And the give get is I'm just I'm going to get into a lot more deals and I'm going to learn a lot more uh, working with the channel. partner. Right, right, right. They don't mean. Through all the years, I have violent agreement with what you just said, but that common sense does not prevail. Oh. I look at it per deal, and I've never been able to figure it out. And then I just will roll over and just say, "Okay, forget about it. We're going to do comp neutral because we got to get we got to drive the right behavior." No, so you know how you solve for that? I finally figured it out. It's part of your interview process with the AE. You find out has the, does the rep stand in front of the channel? building the business using it as a tool to build their business or are they sitting behind the channel looking for leads hire for that yeah but they can easily give an answer so here, here's one on the on the comp plan side so before you said something about uh, earlier on here about reps not being paid until kind of some level of kind of customer success so you obviously have key points where you can get sold on the on the booking on the revenue and then sounds like you might be suggesting a, a, a later piece in the cycle. Nope. Nope. I would, I would, um, I'd say you pay in the booking, but um, in Salesforce, you can't close out the close one in, in, in the companies I work with until value one is, is there you go. Committed. Okay, great. And then uh, quickly here, cause we're out, we're out of time. What about uh, when's the right time to build a channel? After you have a repeatable motion, uh, you're dedicated to um, uh, the right kind of return on investment for the channel partner, and you get your incentives aligned. <laughs> I wouldn't do it before that. Yep. Awesome. But a lot of times, too, though, you also have the channel partners who have some key relationships that can help you early on. Yeah. So if you've got some trusted relationships, you can say, look, we're still baking this out. But if you work with us early on, yeah, you can maybe get some special access or you know some other things that could come into play. Yeah, we talked a lot about channels, but alliances too. Is what is your customer need? Ah, uh, you got me. What is your user need to implement your solution? And if there's gaps in that, and there's other technologies, that's a great alliance partner to go focus on as well. Sell with, as well as sell to. Awesome. Very cool. So, uh, Mark, you've been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Tucker was kind enough to uh, post the blogs. Blog number three is the one that is uh, relevant to what we're talking about today. And uh, you can get a uh, preview, I guess, to uh, blog number four by seeing that there. So thanks. And uh, your wisdom ama is uh, amazing and your thought thoughtfulness is uh, always is great.
So um, next week uh, on Monday, uh, we've got the legendary Tom Mendoza, who had been at uh, NetApp uh, as an early sales leader, then eventually vice chairman. He's on the boards of a bunch of companies like Bronus, Vast Data, UiPath, uh, the, uh, that other Catholic school that's in South Bend. Mm -hmm. uh, their uh, business school is uh, named after him, and he's yeah, amazing in all areas, but especially around uh, culture and leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing it on a Monday because I anticipate our uh, usual Wednesday that uh, hopefully Alabama will be in the uh, SEC baseball tournament. So try to uh, de-risk de me having to change around, especially with somebody like Tom. And uh, thanks to Modigi for uh, sponsoring today. And uh, for those that are members of sales community, thanks. And for those that are not, feel free to check us out at salescommunity.com and you can click on the link spring free. So Tucker also, thanks for your help behind the scenes. Uh, Mark, uh, you're awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Randy, for having me. And all you go to market teams, you need to hang together or as Ben Franklin said, you're going to hang separately. There you go. Awesome. Then Mark, if you can stay on after Tucker uh, cuts us off here. <laughs>